Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, I'm glad to see so many people interested in Android development in DevOps, so thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Jerry Martinez. You can find me on Twitter or on my blog. You can find it on the slide. Um, so back to the talk. The main idea is to show, to demonstrate that nowadays, with the right uh, tools, the right methodology, we can now achieve a full pipeline to release from one git push to a Play Store release. So first, a bit about where I work. Uh, I'm working at Captain Train, uh, obviously on the Android application. Uh, does anyone know about us or what we do? Some? Okay, so basically we sell train tickets around Europe from as many carriers as possible. So the idea is to provide a user experience that the current carriers cannot provide. Uh, so we are together with the backend team trying to integrate as many carriers as possible, so it's going well. Uh, we have been acquired back in February by uh, the train line, and uh, so basically we are still doing the same thing. We are just handling the European train, and they are doing the UK market. So we recruit for almost all positions, so if you're interested, uh, don't hesitate to reach me after the talk. So let's start with the conclusion. It's important to understand that processes depend on context. What I will present today uh, works very well. I already implemented in various projects. At Captain Train, for instance, we use a, a huge part of it. But it remains an objective. Uh, it's a long path to reach uh, this level of maturity on CI process on Android. So it will really depend on your team, your application, uh, your company. Everything on the context is important. So see it more like a recipe that works for me, and take whatever you can uh, that you find useful to be able to reuse it in your case. But yeah, this talk is about the feedback about what I implemented at Captain Train and what is working for us. So if we take another look at my talk's title, what do we call DevOps? So let's take a definition. Uh, it promotes a release process which brings together through communication and collaboration both development and operational teams. Well, we can see that there is a problem here. Uh, I don't have an operational team when I'm working on an Android application. Uh, the only thing I have is a famous and feared uh, developer console, the Play Store developer console. I'm very sure. Uh, how many Android developers are in the room, please? Okay. So many. Uh, how many have written an, an app uh, professionally, like not on a, a weekend project, a pet project? Okay, so most everyone. Okay, great. So the idea is really to see how we can interact with the Play Store. Now. But before going to the Play Store, you must have a good continuous integration. So let's make sure we have the same definition. First for me, it's automated build. Uh, you must stop the, it works only on my machine. Second, uh, the build will fail fast, uh, so you will be able to fix it fast. So you will guarantee you always have a working build, and it's really important. Then your build will always be tested, uh, so you can ensure quality and non revision Then, if you have a constant packaging, uh, you can av avoid human error. If it's it, if it always packaged the same way, there is no reason it won't work the day you need it. And finally, every release, since you are a bit more confident uh, in your process and you trust it, uh, you will av avoid bad surprises and you will have a easier release. So why I'm talking about continuous integration, uh, and you will see it's some part of my talk, like 10 or 15 minutes, it's because that's a source of a solid process. Um, maybe it's obvious for you. I think you are DevOps. You you probably know about continuous integration stuff and, and things like that. But uh, that's not what I see in Paris when I meet customers and stuff like that. They are not really. I, I still see people building APK on their machine and just not using testing and stuff like that. So that's why this is important to have a reminder about it. Uh, 
it's something that grows a lot uh, recently, like the last two years. And but I still see some project neglected. So yeah, so we take some time to see how we can have a solid process for the continuous integration. So here is a very standard pipeline, I guess, nothing fancy. So our Arcatum train, we use GitLab as our integration server. But there are many others that work perfectly fine. Uh, Jenkins CI, Circle CI, Travis CI, Go CD, and so on. Um, GitLab is a very good tool. Um, and we are already using it for the source management. So we just go with it, went with it, because yeah, backend was using it and stuff, uh, and they also. So let's start with the first step, which is a push. How we work at Captain Train? We have two branches, one dev, one master. Uh, when we merge dev into master, we tag, and then that corresponds to a release. Uh, then when we want to write a new feature, we make a branch, write some code, commits. Then if we want to merge it into dev, uh, you have to be always rebased. Uh, so we rebase the stuff, so rebase the branch, and then you can, we can merge it. And this feature will be later merged into the master process, into the master branch. Sorry. So a few, tr a few rules we have. A merge request is mandatory with always at least one reviewer. Uh, your branch must always be rebased, and, with, uh, and every merge is done with a merge commit. So no fast forward. It's always the reviewers that will be that will merge the branch. Uh, we used to say that if there is a bug in production, 51% of the responsibility is for the developers that implemented the feature. 49% is for the reviewer. So it's we since we have a small team, we do every, everything ourselves, QA, test, uh, human testing, and stuff like that. So it's important to bring everybody on board about the responsibilities that we share across the project. Uh, and of course, a branch must always be rebased. Once again, nothing fancy. The next step is the build. So here we have two builds, the debug and the release. The debug is done on the dev branch, the release is done on the master branch. We, of course, use Gradle. Uh, I don't know if anyone is using something else than Gradle. It's probably not a ba the best idea right now. Uh, it's fully supported by Google. It's really maintained. It's upgrading a lot recently. and. Yeah, there is really no reason to use anything else. We also use Docker uh, to build our APK on the on the CI. So, okay, sorry for the French one. Uh, every build is is related. Uh, we have different architecture possible, and finally, we have more power. Uh, the thing is, before we had to connect to the CI server. We didn't have the credentials with Android team because we don't use it so much. So be, uh, being able to build with Docker let us make it us able to really easily work and to really have the power to upgrade the SDK and stuff like that. Then the next step is the testing. So firstly, if you doubt it, Yes, we test even on Android. For the unit test, basically, uh, it has been here for more than two years. We finally have a JUnit 4 syntaxes. Before, we had just the JUnit 3, which is really pain in the ass, just to, to say a little. So we also have something called RoboElectric. Uh, who does know about RoboElectric in the room? OK. so. Just a reminder, RoboElectric basically is a way to test your Android code directly on a GVM. It will shadow some classes from the Android framework, load them in the, in the GVM running your unit, your unit testing, and you will be able to test some stuff. You have to be really careful about RoboElectric, because most of the time you, when you are interacting with Android framework, you are not... Uh, testing uh, using the Android framework. You are using a shadow that is not the real code. So be careful about it. And uh, what I say a lot is you have to test your code that is using the Android framework, not to test the Android framework. Uh, I saw a lot of people trying to test, I don't know, the life cycle of an activity or package manager and stuff like that. So that's really not a good idea. Just stick with the uh, 
with testing your use of the framework. For instance, I use it a lot for testing my parcel label. Just an example. So how does it work? It's really easy. That's a good point. It's a dependency, and then you have to add two annotations. The first one is the at run with that you will be able to um, to run RoboLectric test, basically. The second one is the config, where you will be able to um, to add some configuration, like uh, where is the path of the manifest, uh, which SDK you want to run your test on, and stuff like that. Integration test. So there was this debate like some years ago, like one, two years ago, Espresso Robosium. There is not anymore. Uh, really, Espresso is really, once again, maintained, supported, and upgrading with Google. So it's really the, the better tool, actually, to, to work uh, integration test. So integration test, instrumentation test, end-to-end. -end. I mean, that's probably all the same. He has to run on the device. So yeah, um, my, uh, my opinion is that for integration test, most of the time you only want to test the main user flow. Uh, it depends where you are in your project, uh, but for instance at Captain Train we are, ch we are changing a lot of stuff all the time, so maintaining our instrumentation test would be just not possible. I mean, we have two and a half people in the team right now, so yeah, I it would take too, too many times. Uh, but I think when you reach th this point in your project where you are more maintaining it, that you know, uh, creating it, it's a good idea because, yeah, you will avoid regression and stuff like that. Uh, for instance, at Captain Train, uh, so as I said, we sell train tickets. Uh, so what I want to be able to test is the search, the, the cart, so be able to book a, a ticket, uh, to pay a ticket, and finally to see my ticket and be able to travel with it. So that's what we will test. Uh, it's really... Uh, yeah, the main flow, and uh, why our users are downloading our app. Um, yeah, uh, that's the main idea, because uh, if you are familiar a bit with the train, uh, you know the fares are really complicated. This is an old industry, and uh, I couldn't test that every card, and every discount card with uh, every route is working well. So we just try to have a a test that will ensure that our main goal is always uh, verified and uh, checked in our CI. And that's it for the test. A bit about the quality. For instance, when I said earlier that at Captain Train we implemented a, a huge part of it, uh, of the process I will present today, this is the case where we, didn't, we don't use what I will present. Uh, because we are a small team, and we have huge and in-depth uh, code reviews, so really count on that to be able to uh, to maintain our cleanliness of the code, I would say. Uh, but there are some tools that can help you, especially if you have a lot of uh, junior developers in your team, or if you have, uh, I don't know, if you are alone. I mean, that happens a lot to me before. Uh, I'm just the one guy doing the Android application, so I need someone to verify or something that I'm not just writing bad stuff. So SonarCube is the one. Uh, it's really a, a great tool, basically. Uh, it regroups rules that you share with your team or that you shared, and it will monitor your Java code and do uh, a syntaxis analysis, donc, uh, a static analysis. So you will be able to retrieve some uh, health indicator about your project, uh, about your Android application code base. Uh, it's very easy to set up, and I'm pretty sure most of you already know about it. So it's just a Gradle plugin to add and Gradle text to run, and uh, it's working perfectly. Then you have Lint. So does anyone, does everyone know about Lint or what is Lint on Android? Okay, so Lint is a tool uh, associated with Android uh, that will monitor your code to find errors and warning on um, really specific Android problems. For instance, um, when you want to use a method, uh, but it, knows it is not available for the Android version uh, you are supporting, for instance, I don't know, I want to use a method available in 18, in API 18, I am just supporting 16, so 
there will be a crash on the 16 and 17 AP API and, de and devices. So it will say, okay, here you are doing something bad. It will also help you with uh, runtime permission, for instance. You say, okay, I access something about the contacts of your device, and you didn't ask for the permission. Since this is a dangerous runtime permission, you have to make it validated by the, by the user. Uh, so it will raise a, an error and say, okay, yeah, there is something wrong also here. And finally, another example I have is um, when you are code a string, uh, it raises a, a warning saying, okay, one day you will probably want to be multilingual. It will be really difficult because yeah, you, you should not uh, out code a string. But what less people know is that you can go really further. Actually, you can implement your a custom lint. So what is a custom lint? It's basically implementing your own uh, lint rules. So this is a classic Java project uh, that will have a task, uh, for instance, Gradle, that will have a task that will ins uh, install uh, your jar that in the dot .android slash lint, I think. Uh, and you will see that I will show some code that it's really simple and it really can help uh, your team. For instance, um, the issue we'll try to detect here is um, every attribute that we write in our Android application must be prefixed by city to make sure we avoid clashes uh, with other library you could use. So the first thing is to extend uh, a detector. Here I extend the resource XML detector, but there are a lot of detectors, like Java detector, by uh, class detector, uh, translation detector. There are really Google is already providing a lot of detectors that you can just plug in and extend a bit to match your behavior, but it's really easy. For the issue, when you create it, you have to pass an ID, so a TTR not prefixed. Uh, you must explain what you are checking, so you must prefix your custom TTR by city. Uh, you may explain why you are doing it, actually. So we prefix all our TTRs to avoid clashes. Finally, you provide a category, a, t a priority, and a severity. And then you link the implementation you have with the scope. Uh, this scope is where should I go? Uh, it helps Lin to say, okay, I should look at the resource file scope. So at the resource files. Uh, but you can say uh, also the Java files, the class files, and stuff like that. Once you have your issue in the uh, resource XML detector, it's really easy. It's almost filters. The first one is, okay, I want to look only I at XML files. The second one is, I just want to look at the folder values. Then you say, I just want to look at the attitier tags. And in the attitier tags, I want to look at the name attributes. And once you filter everything, when you arrive at the visit element method, you have the good stuff. So you are returning your attribute node, check getting the value, and if it doesn't start with Android or with City, you will report an issue. So when you report an issue, you provide the issue we created before, the, the constant, the node, where it happens, and what they call a, a location and another definition, it will help the IDE to display a, a warning directly inside with this information and to locate where, it, where you have the problem. So it's really interesting. The final step is to create another class, which is called a issue registry. For instance, in Captain Trends, like Captain Ten Registry, uh, and you provide the list of issues you are supporting. That's where uh, the lint will go. It will retrieve all the issue registry extension, and will retrieve all the issues, and uh, then it will be able to uh, generate a custom report. And the result will look something like that. So usability in the typography step, and you have then uh, the explanation. So please. Do not underestimate the lint rules. They are really powerful and they can really be useful. I see mainly two use cases. The, the first one is you have a, a junior team, for instance, and you want to be sure they respect the rule you, you created or you are integrating new people and you want to make sure they use the same code rules around among the project in Android. You can write the lint rules to make sure they are. Another, um, Use case I have is when you provide a new library, for instance, an open source library, you want to make sure that the developers that are using it uh, 
use it the right way. So basically, you, you provide the lint rules that can, that, that can be installed. And then they are able to see, OK, that's how the library maintainer has seen the stuff. So I should follow. Well, it's good practice. And then packaging. So nothing fancy here again. First, filter your resources. ProGuard uh, your, uh, your, uh, your APK, your code base. It's not about the obfuscation stuff, because there is no real security on Android, I would say. It's more about the um, to cut the, the method and the class you are not using, but that are available in the library uh, to make your APK smaller. Assemble, sign your APK, and finally zipper line. About the sign stuff, don't lose the key store. It happens to a friend of mine. It's difficult then. Zipper line your APK. Uh, a small tip I, I could give is um, if you use the, do the dash Z for option, it will use another algorithm to zipper line, uh, which is, I, I think it, it was. Um, Free time um, lower, uh, slower, but since you are building your APK, it doesn't really count at this moment. Uh, but it reduces the APK size from 2 to 5%, so it can just be, I mean, it's free si uh, size saving, so don't hesitate. I think the algorithm is called Zopfly, to, to be clear. OK, then we have a good continuous integration. At the end of the continuous integration, we have an APK. What do we do now? So the first step is to do continuous delivery. So what do I call continuous delivery? Basically, I call it, the definition is automate releases in order to deliver quickly, easily, and reliably. OK. So makes sense. What about the continuous deployment? OK, so my advice is continuous deployment on native Android app is not really a good idea. I see two, three, three main reasons, I think. The first one is too many updates. Every time you update your app, you user have a notification. So if a user sees too many uh, um, updates, like, I don't know, every day, every two hours, probably you can, he will start to ask questions. I mean, why is the updating so so many, so many times. I mean, is there a bug? Uh, can I trust them? The, so, the thing also is about the bandwidth. Uh, if you are working for an app uh, for uh, some countries, it could be difficult for them to be able to download every update you have. So be careful about it. The other stuff is about marketing. So. When you don't have enough content between two releases, it's really difficult to um, write some release notes. And actually, release notes are something that is pretty much read by the user on Play Store, and they are really interesting it. So we really use it at Captain Train as a marketing, uh, marketing, yeah, marketing way uh, to to market our app basically, uh, and it can be really useful to have some content and to be able to see. Okay, we take like a, a rendezvous with. Uh, with our user and say, okay, here are the news. Uh, don't for, uh, we, do, we didn't forget it, forget you. Uh, our app is still on maintenance. We are still using it, so be, uh, don't uh, don't be afraid. We are still working on it. So what I what I want to sum up is um, being able to release every hour, every commit, every day is not something you always want to do. You have to be careful. It's not because you can do it that you want to do it. So uh, just be careful about it and think about your use case and stuff like that. Obviously, it depends where you are in your project. If you are uh, writing in right now and uh, uh, you are quitting it, you will probably have to confront you to the production uh, f um, faster. OK, so we talked about release for the, for the beginning of the talk. But what is a release for, uh, for you? For me, it's really simple. It's some steps, a beta step, then a rollout from 5 to 100%. It happens on two weeks. Uh, first week for the beta, which is composed only of, I don't know, 100 people maybe, that are uh, huge traveler by train, uh, that use the app almost every week, at least. 
and uh, they yeah they try the app a lot so we can have a good feedback about it and then we have this reload for one week so one day each day we ex we increase the, the percentage it's done every six weeks on Tuesday so why well um, why six weeks uh, at the beginning it was four weeks uh, because four weeks was really work for all for us it's a good time between Having, like I said, a rendezvous with your uh, with your user, be able to keep them alert, I would say, and uh, also six week is large enough to be able to ship really feature, real, real feature. We we see that r right now we have some problem because um, our feature are taking a lot of uh, a lot of time to be implemented. So six weeks is really perfect for us. And why on Tuesday? Uh, because not on Friday. Uh, and because um, Tuesday was really great for us because all the team is in the office at this moment and also it has a reputation to be the best marketable day. Uh, so yeah, we went on Tuesday, but as I say, it depends on your, on your company. Yeah. So when we want to release, basically, as I said earlier, we merge dev into master, then it launched the continuous integration process, and then the continuous delivery process. So the continuous delivery process is composed of two uh, main uh, ports. The first one is a screenshot, and then there is the publish one. About the screenshot, the only thing I, say, I can say is don't neglect it. It's really useful, uh, especially for a startup like us, uh, to uh, earn some conversion. Uh, it really helps, and I if you have bad screenshot, uh, it can really deserve you, so be careful. Uh, be careful about it. So, but for instance, at Captain Train, we are handling, we are managing five languages. We take six screenshots for each languages, and we have four devices: the phone five, the tablet seven, the tablet nine, and the Wear. So that makes a lot of screenshots, almost 200. So we automated it. How we did it? We used, I mean, we did it like two years ago. It was done by uh, someone called Flavien Laurent in my team. Uh, it was a non made tool with a U UI automator. We are right now thinking about changing this stuff, but it works for us. It works really well. But there are, also, there are now other tools you can use on the market. There are, if you are using Spoon with your transformation test, there is no reason to not reuse the screenshot it's taking to, to, use, it, to use them on the Play Store. And then there are also this. Uh, tool screen grab by Fastlane that is working really great and is open source and is doing by the by Twitter so you should check it out and then there is the publish so the publish my first idea was how can I avoid bad surprises because after all I'm dealing with production and when I heard Captain Train I see that my colleagues were testing some stuff manually and I was like okay now we can continue to do that so what are you actually testing manually Wha what are you afraid of the first thing they were afraid is the permission so when you bump a library the library can bring permission you didn't want and you will see it only when you upload on the play store so the idea here is to check them on a uni unite test so it's really easy. I can show some code. Uh, basically, I, yeah, I wrote a Unite test. We retrieve from the merge manifest all the permission. Uh, the merge manifest is um, before building your UIPK, the Android build system will retrieve all the Android manifests from all your library are using it, including your own. It will merge them into a single one, and then it will be uh, bundled into your UIPK. So the idea is to just retrieve this SPK at this moment and retrieve all the permission it has and compare it with the one you want. And if there is a, if there is a mismatch, we fail the build. Sorry. Then there was testing a lot, uh, database upgrade, uh, upgrades. Uh, I think most of us have a persistent solution in the app. It's almost mandatory nowadays. So we, you probably have a SQLite database or real or whatever, but you have some you have upgrades. So I wrote also a unit test to to do this. 
so basically we just import a GDBC, a GDBC sorry, um, um, driver, and then we wrote a, uh, I wrote a unit test. So you, this unit test is um, we create a DPO panel bar that just uh, representing the SQLite database. Then we use the onCreate method on a, a new database, like a from scratch database that has nothing in it. And then we use the onUpgrade method on the origin database from the version one to the current version of the database. The origin database is the database in the state of our first release in the Android application. Then from these two database, so we have one database read from scratch with all such schema, the schema, and uh, one database upgrading every upgrade we, all, we ever released, they should be the same. So we extract the two schema from them and we compare them. If there is a mismatch, we fail the build. To extract the schema is really simple. Uh, we retrieve the connection with the GDPC driver, obviously. And then in the metadata, we are able to retrieve the table. We build like a string, which, which is more like a key, actually, of uh, an, ad an identifier of our application, of our table, sorry, with the table type and the table name. Table type because uh, you can, with this method, you also retrieve the views, if you have some. Once it's done, we do exactly the same for all the colon of all the table. We build an identifier, sorry with the column name, the type name, the is new label, and the default. We build this, this string, which is basically, yeah, it really identifies this column, and we add it to the schema. So at the end, we have everything, uh, we have a set of string that where each string represents either a table or a column, and exactly what is the table and what is the column in our schema. But you can go, you can go further if you wish. You can have primary keys, cross-references, and indexes. And almost everything you have is in the GDBC metadata. Okay, so once I removed all the things that we were afraid of, we can go to the Play Store. So, hey, let's start a, a small game. To your opinion, what does this tiny arrow do here? Do anyone has an idea? Exactly, yeah. It actually, it's not select the percentage, it selects the track you want to, to release. So if you want to release on the production, on beta, or on a rollout, you will then have to choose the, the track. But I mean, it's really not obvious, and it can be really tricky. And um, I would assume that something like that, like the percentage of the rollout, will be asked later. But no, it's really asked there, and I mean, it really happened. It already happened in, in our release process. We click on it and say, "Oh, short, 100 percent." Sorry. So, yeah, uh, this, is, this is just an example how the Play Store console can be tricky, and that's not a task you want a human to do because human forgot. You might make mistakes. Oh, yeah, another one is okay. Let's say uh, you have published your APK to five percent, and then you need to do a hotfix. When you publish it again, you have this dialog. What does the publish note production do? Does it, I mean, uh, does it release to 5% or to 100%? The, the truth is it released to 5%, so it does a good thing. But when you click it, you don't know. Uh, and you are always afraid of clicking it. Okay, okay, hopefully it will work as I wish, but I don't know about it. You see, this is just, Another example, sorry, this is just another example of why the console can be tricky and you have to be careful when you click on it. So we wanted to remove this step. So it works really easily. You have to first go to the first console, which is the developer console. You create a new project. You enable the Google API Android developer, the Google Play, sorry, Android developer API. Then you go to create a new credential. You take the service account key one, which will make you download a JSON file that will be that we will use later. So you, you save it and you then you you continue the process. Then you go to the play console. You go to settings, API access, and then you link your project. So if since that's the same uh, account. 
you will see that all the projects from the developer console are available in the play console, and you can link them or unlink them. It allows you to use the same publisher on several applications and to use several publishers on the same application. So you can do whatever you want, basically. Then you choose a client. So Google provides an HTTP API, but you can, they also provide the Java, Ruby, and Python. So you can choose whatever you want. I will go with the Java because I assume everyone here is familiar with Java since we are on Android uh, talk. So we use um, this dependency with the version v2 dash ref 20 dash 1.21.0 that nobody understands why, but this is uh, the one. It's, uh, you have to be up to date because I change it sometimes. And then we can start to script basically our release. So first, we retrieve an HTTP transport layer, a JSON um, factory, and then we create a credential. So for these credentials, that's where your JSON file you downloaded from the developer console layer will be useful. So you provide the transport and JSON factory, of course, and then you provide a private key ID, uh, which is in the JSON file, then a service icon ID, which is not in JSON file, it's your email address, I didn't know before writing, so I have to try some stuff to make it work. Um, then you provide the scope, because this credential could be used for several scope. In our case, we only want the Android publisher. And then you provide uh, the private key you, downloaded, you downloaded, which is in the JSON file. And then, finally, you are able to create a new publish, uh, pu publisher, uh, which you will precise the package name. And then you will see it's always the same. The naming are quite bad, I think, but uh, it works. So from the publisher, you retrieve an edits. An edits is basically a transaction manager. I mean, that's how they should call it, but that's an edit. Then from, its edi from this edits, you insert a new package, a new, uh, uh, a new transaction, basically, with the package name. And then from this transaction, you retrieve an, you retrieve an ID, which is the transaction ID that is, will be used on every call then uh, later. Once you have, as I said, once you have this ID, you can start publishing stuff. So the first thing is to retrieve the listings. You create a new listing. The listing is basically yeah, the object where you will add your listing, and then you will commit it, and it will be uh, released. So you create um, a listing, and then you update it with the package, the transactional ID, the local for which you are publishing, publishing, sorry, and the listing. And then that's always the same. Let's see together for the images, so the screenshot, you retrieve an object images, you create a new file content, which is your image with the mind type, and then you upload it with the package, the transactional ID, the local for which you are publishing, and uh, the type of the, uh, the type of the device. Every device is, is, of course, available. Phone 5, Tablet 7, Tablet 9, Wear, so everything can be automated. automated. And then we go on on the APKs. That's where you're interesting, I guess. So we retrieve the APKs. Uh, we create a new APK. And then we upload it with the package, the transactional ID, and new APK. And we retrieve this object, which is returned as an, IP, an APK, because we want the version code, because the version code will also be used for the later call. Once you publish your APK, you will, assign, we, you will assign it a track. So you will your tracks. You create a new track with the version code. And then you update it with the package, the transactional ID, and the type of tracks you want. Here, there are also several uh, all the ones, all the, all the one you need. Production, rollout, beta, and alpha. And finally, yeah, finally, we have the APK listings. So as the APK listing corresponds to the what's new you have on the Play Store, so you retrieve an APK listings, you create a new one with your recent change, so your what's new, and then you update it with the package, the transactional ID, the version of the APK, the local you, for the, f the local you need, and the content, and then you execute it. Final step, we, have, we need to validate, basically, our, uh, our transaction to make sure everything will go smoothly. Because Google has some rules, like um, 
you have to have a title less than 32 characters, I think. You have a long description that must be, you have a, the what's new, for instance, must be less than 500 characters. So it will check that everything is okay on, the, on this rule. And then we'll be able to commit the transaction, which we actually makes the release and the process. So we saw that we are able, with this API, to update the listing, the screenshot, the APK, the what's new, and the tracks. So basically, everything you do actually currently directly with a click and click and drag on the console. So this script is unmade. Uh, I did it like more than one year ago now. Uh, but there are also several solutions that appears right now. So there is a Gradle plugin, which you can use. I think Fastlane also, I didn't update it the slide, but I think Fastlane also writing a tools to, to be able to uh, upload to the Play Store directly. So there is a Gradle plugin, which is just a task you have to run with the configuration you want. And then there is, a Jenkins pl yeah, there is also a Jenkins plugin. A good reason why we still use our homemade tools, it's first, we own it, so we really know what we are doing. And we have some constraint like, the screenshot are stored on an outside server where we really want to go with our credential to retrieve the stuff. So it, it would be difficult to use another tool, actually. And then we're done. So we went from one push through a full continuous integration process with build, test, quality, and packaging. At the end, we generated an APK. And then we, get, we went to the continuous uh, delivery uh, process with taking the description automatically and then publishing everything on the Play Store. Thank you. It's all for me. <laughs> if you have any questions, I think we have some time. So don't hesitate. There is a mic over there if you want to use it. Otherwise, I will repeat the question. So, yeah. Yeah, so the question was, uh, did I consider writing the tests will, uh, with the PO and, st uh, and people that are more... Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so at Captain Train, the, we are three people, we are startup, so basically we do everything. So there is no PO, uh, we, have, we own our own product, so, so that's great, but it means we are in charge of maintaining the test, making sure they are good for the product, and developing the features, so we don't have this case of synchronizing, so since we own everything. But as I said, it depends on the case. Uh, I think it's great uh, if you have a huge team and huge process with a product owner that is really in uh, implicated in your, in your team, it's probably great to have uh, someone make sh making sure that the tests are working well, but it has to be a bit technical because really Andrew Espresso testing are not really easily read or I mean, no one, well, probably it's more, it's more the developers that has to write them. So yeah, you have to, to be sure. Yeah, cucumber and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I know about them. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be a good solution. I mean, I don't have the problem, so I didn't implement it on anything else, but yeah, that would be a good solution, I think. I, I know, see, uh, Shazam wrote something about it, so probably was worth, worth checking it. Is there other questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. If it, if it can't validate it, yeah, it fails. And uh, it reports to me, yeah, okay, it fails because uh, <laughs> you, you didn't make sure that your title was less than 32 characters, so I fix it and then I re-upload it. 
So yeah, I have to start the build, uh, the process uh, by hand because I won't merge again. So yeah, but we try to make sure. Actually, uh, uh, I have some U uh, unite test that run on this project, which makes sure that all the content stored uh, from the marketing are always validated. So yeah, so I don't have this problem. Most of the time, it's validated. It's just to make sure everything is is. But I never validate, never fails in, in my side. But, uh, is there? Any other question? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't see you. Oh, yeah. Good question. Uh, we <laughs> it's bad. Uh, we used to store it in the Git, in our Git repository. Uh, now we store it um, in another project, which is encrypted, which we, I mean, yeah, I, I'm not the one that did it. So uh, I'm not really sure, but I think we'll start it in, a, in, in another Git where it's all encrypted and you have to have the good write and stuff like that. Which and the credentials for this Git are only stored on the CI machine, that is not accessible by everyone. I think that's how we do it, but uh, I'm not really sure to be honest. So we're done. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining. And uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me later. And uh, have a good meal.